Hello. Hello. Thank you for this uh, second uh, part of, the, of our session. We will start uh, right away with Manuel making the presentation now. Um, and in the end, we will have some information to share with you, and some of you know this already. We are planning a special issue on the topic of this presentation. And in the end of the session, hopefully we can talk about that with you. So, thank you so much. Um, hello, everybody. My name is Manuel Marni. I'm faculty at Polytechnique Montreal and a member of the CIREC. It's an inter-university research center on uh, life cycle assessment of product services and processes. So, and I'm pleased to uh, share with you some uh, research, inter interdisciplinary research we've made with uh, folks of this community, uh, especially um, Patrick Keyes and uh, Lan Wang, uh, and Sarah Cornell, and a couple of researchers from Unilever, uh, Sarah Sim and Henry King, and a couple of engineers in academia, including my uh, postdoc, Anders Bjorn, who I should acknowledge for uh, this uh, research and uh, unfortunately couldn't make to, to, come, to come here. Um, so for those who are less familiar with uh, LCA, just briefly, um, it's, it's, an assess it's, it's, a, it's an approach that allows you uh, to assess uh, the potential impacts of uh, a product or a service throughout its whole uh, life cycle. The assessment is performed in two steps. In the first steps, we are tracking activities uh, throughout the life cycles uh, that provides a given uh, function uh, in order to obtain a so-called life cycle inventory. So uh, an inventory of resources uh, that we are taking from the ecosphere and emissions that we are releasing to the, to the ecosphere. And then we are using um, a natural science-based model uh, to evaluate what are the potential impacts of those emissions uh, on uh, uh, multiple uh, um, uh, issues, including uh, climate change, electrification, the water, uh, water depletion, and so on and so on. And, and we could model the causality chain up to the endpoints, which are grouped into um, three are, uh, few areas of protection, like your human health, natural environment, and uh, natural uh, resources. And of course, uh, land use it is one of the impact categories we are addressing in uh, life cycle assessment. So state of the art in, um, uh, in how we address uh, uh, impacts of land use in LCA, it's basically that we need to know uh, uh, the locations, um, the type of uh, land cover change, um, the amount, uh, that is change and the duration of the new land cover. And uh, traditionally, uh, LCA methods were covering, um, um, were modeling uh, causality chains to determine the loss of biodiversity uh, on, on the sites where land has been changed and uh, the loss of ecosystem services focusing on targeted. Um, uh, um, um, uh, ecological functions like uh, uh, the loss uh, soil, uh, soil erosion resi res resistance or um, uh, groundwater replenishment potential and so on. And of course, we also, had, uh, we also have uh, methods that accounts for uh, global effects on uh, climate change due to uh, a change in stock of biogenic carbon uh, in, in, in land. And what's missing, what's missing is this, uh, this piece of the puzzle. Uh, that basically, uh, this is the, um, the, the, the objective of uh, our uh, research work, basically um, to uh, fill in current gaps in modeling uh, bio-geophysical uh, uh, effects from land use uh, for regional level in life cycle impact assessment. Uh, by modeling specifically uh, a change in uh, um, precipitation or uh, surface air temperature um, uh, in the locations of uh, a land cover change and on the other location uh, down, downwind affected by, by this change. And of course, this type of work should be complementary with uh, current methods that accounts for uh, bio-geochemical uh, uh, effects. Um, the literature reports that uh, um, 
the effects of land cover change on local and um, regional atmospheric heat and moisture uh, might be in the same order of magnitude uh, than uh, biogeochemical effects on uh, air temperature associated with an increasing of uh, CO2 in the atmosphere. Um, for example, uh, Western colleagues report that changes in surface energy and water balances uh, from large-scale deforestation in the Amazon rainforest um, might impact the regional climate of the Amazon basin uh, in the same order of magnitude than doubling uh, the CO2 in the atmosphere. Uh, and moreover, opla, and moreover, um, biogeochemical physical, uh, biogeophysical <laughs> sus, uh, um, surface air temperature impacts uh, from land uh, change, yes, um, uh, may be uh, or act in opposite, opposite directions uh, than the biogeochemical impacts. Uh, let's think about um, increase in surface air temperature from albedo effects from afforested um, boreal regions. So, biogeophysical bio land effects works uh, through a change in albedo, through a change in evapotranspirations, and through a change in uh, land surface roughness. And we have been, uh, we've seen in the, in the literature some, some research work, like the one that, that Mike Latier performed, that basically make a clear link uh, between um, the change in, in land use and the change in evapotranspiration that leads to a change in, uh, in precipitations in the same area or in, in, in downwind, downwind locations by uh, influencing so, uh, local and regional met meteorological mechanisms. And similarly, uh, land use and land use change also affect surface air temperature, capturing the responses of change in surface energy budget. For example, um, land cover change might result in a change in uh, the net uh, radiation of um, the land surface through a change in surface albedo and uh, a change in the shared net radiation between latent and uh, sensible heat, the first one being responsible for the evapotranspiration. And uh, also there is literature like, like the Brighton colleagues that recently indicated that change in turbulent heat flux uh, might be even uh, more important than uh, radiative uh, processes in, in, uh, in, in shifting the, the, the energy budget uh, at the local uh, level. So uh, our proposals and looking at uh, what this community uh, is developing, um, it's to model land use effects on precipitations um, in LCA by focusing on terrestrial uh, moisture uh, recycling. And to do so, we suggest to use land, uh, a land, model, uh, land surface model that tracks basically where a change in evapotranspiration leads to a change in uh, precipitation. Uh, as the example of uh, the work uh, done by two of our co-authors, uh, Patrick uh, Keane and uh, Lan Wang, uh, modeling uh, large-scale vegetation removals and the consequences on the evaporate transpirations that led basically to a uh, change in uh, downwind um, uh, precipitations. And there is some uh, ongoing work uh, at TU Berlin that basically researchers are using a global model to link uh, a change in evapotranspirations and a change in uh, uh, precipitations in uh, a different, uh, a different uh, cells. So, and to model land use effects on surface air temperature, uh, also for use in LCA, um, um, we follow the recommendation of uh, Brighton colleagues to use a simplified approach uh, to only consider direct effects uh, from change in energy balance uh, from albedo and evapo evapotranspiration. Uh, neglecting uh, feedback uh, effects. And uh, basically, um, um, bright proposals involves modeling a, a global grid and map um, of changes in surface air temperature for, ch for changes in albedo and evapotranspiration 
associated with all possible uh, land use changes. And to do so, basically, we need to, um, uh, we need to model, uh, to, to run the model per each cells and see what are the consequences to other, um, to other cells of the models. And in that case, we could develop what's called characterization factors that we are using in, in LCA. So uh, models are a simplified representation of reality. It's good because they can provide us an answer, but reality is a bit more complex than that. And uh, natural systems do not react linearly uh, to human pressures. And um, this is what I've learned in, the, in those two days. <laughs> Basically, uh, there are lots of feedback uh, uh, mechanisms that need to be taken in, into account that uh, we are currently not taking into account with these simplified, simplified models. And so, uh, to conclude, uh, we've seen that the reason, uh, well, it's relevant to consider biogeophysical effects of land use in LCA, complementary to biogeochemical effects. Uh, existing simplified approach are available uh, for estimating regional effects from land use in uh, product life cycles on precipitations and on air, uh, surface air temperature indicators. And nevertheless, additional research is needed uh, to understand the role of uh, non-linearities, uh, potentially causing uh, cascading uh, feedbacks on uh, the ecosystem response, and also to understand what are the thresholds, thresholds based on uh, planetary boundary concepts, and finally, uh, to better understand the interactions between uh, land use change and other uh, environmental issues like uh, fresh, fresh water scarcity. And having said that, Thank you for the understandings, and I'm ready to take a few questions. So, is there any question to Manuela? Okay. I have a question. This is quite interesting, and, and you should all know it, and it's, I'm not going into this field, but I wonder how easy to, it is to convey this message in the LCA results, yeah. I mean, even to a product, um, to a product policy or something yeah. like well, this. Thank, thank you for the, uh, for the question. Because, uh, LCA is a uh, tool that helps decision makers to take more informed decisions. So, and we cannot uh, provide decision makers uh, complex, complex models. So the way that, the, the, uh, that LCA translates information to decision makers it's to having a, a comprehensive and broad overview and basically linearizing everything. So that's why we are trying to use uh, what you're developing in this community, so complex models, and trying to get some s simple numbers that are multipliers to the inventories that we are developing uh, when calculating the, the life cycle inventories of uh, product and services. So we obtain a list of inventories and we need some factors to multiply, like the GWP for, uh, for climate change. Well, we are uh, trying to develop some equivalent to GWP for, for land use. Uh, but behind there is a whole complexity, and this is where I'm coming to search sophistication and complexity to have better factors to take better decisions. So, uh, thank you for the lecture. I would like to ask, I'm not quite convinced about um, the level of simplification that is required in producing the characterization factors. So, you're dealing with uh, a system that involves teleconnections, means that uh, uh, land use change in one place may affect uh, climate or precipitation in other places. Then it also uh, includes telecoupling, so consumption occurs in one place, production in different place, land use change in another place, and then characterization factor is just kind of an average figure. So how, co how are you going to deal with these um, complexities? Um, Thank yeah. you. I appreciate the question. And basically you described the, the current state of LCA that basically uh, we don't know where the activities take place. Uh, so we are forced to make some assumptions that, uh, well, emissions are taking place somewhere in the world or in the world or if we are 
uh, lucky we can determine whether those are take, taking place in Europe or in uh, South America and so on. And once we know where those emissions are taking place, so we, are, we, we could try to characterize those emissions with characterization factors that usually are generic. Uh, but as, as, um, as long as we are able to, to have spatially differentiated uh, models to, to, to model the technosphere, so to know exactly where the emissions are taking place and spatially differentiated model to, be, to better understand uh, where the consequences of those emissions are taking place. So we, un we can ultimately uh, aggregate everything into stochastic informations and provide uh, some numbers, some better estimates with the distributions and say, if you don't know where your emission is taking place, uh, well, you, 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 you might have a, mo uh, have a most probable information and a distribution about um, the, the missing information of the locations where your emission is taking place. So this is where um, research is, co is currently heading, trying to inform uh, those simple factors we are using in LCA with some certain information uh, due to the lack in of information from the, from the locations where activities are occurring and emissions are occurring. And I, I invite the next presenter, Imke, to, yeah. Thank you so much. Um, I will present to you some of the ongoing work in our project BioLCA, uh, Indicators for Biodiversity and Life Cycle Assessment. Um, and we are working on two different indicators at the moment, um, which we will uh, develop and test in a case study on beef production in Sweden. Now, I will go through both these indicators today. Um, and the first one is the landscape biodiversity capacity, uh, an index which is mainly tested and developed uh, by your colleagues at Trifte University. Uh, and it assesses the, um, what is it, the uh, capability of the landscape to sustain biodiversity uh, by uh, the area of biotopes, the heterogeneity, um, but those two alone doesn't give us any information on how different patches are, um, well, the spatial distribution of patches, uh, how well they are connected. Uh, so functional connectivity looks into um, how well these patches can, uh, how well they are connected based on the dispersal capacity of uh, focal species. So the higher the functional connectivity, the easier it is for species to disperse to use to recolonize uh, new patches of the landscape. Now this is basically a huge uh, matrix uh, of which the values are based on the, um, the distance between two patches of the si same biotope, um, the dispersal ability of, of species, and here you see uh, uh, an example of a butterfly uh, which are not really likely to uh, disperse more than 500 meter, for example. Uh, now, you can imagine that for the same butterfly, uh, a patch of 350 meters of forest is a huge barrier. Um, so the resistance in the landscape uh, also plays a role here. Uh, the second indicator um, is uh, environmental DNA meta barcoding, um, which is uh, well, there's a sort of a revolution uh, ongoing over the last couple of years in uh, molecular tools, which opens up for a lot of new opportunities within environmental sciences. Uh, and this is one of them. Um, it's based on the fact that species or organisms leave a lot of um, DNA traces in the environment. 
This could be skin, this could be urine, this could be blood, uh, pollen, for example, or leaves. Um, uh, and you can extract this DNA from it. Uh, and from this data, we can detect a species presence uh, and assess the overall biodiversity of, uh, of the environment. Uh, now, most of what we know about biodiversity is actually based on large, uh, large size, well-studied animals uh, like flower, uh, flowering plants, uh, mammals, um, birds, for example. Um, and some studies indicate that we actually know much more about the cute animals than the ugly ones. Um, and then I'm not talking about microorganisms and um, insects, for example. So this is obviously a bit problematic, uh, mainly because the latter ones are even likely to play an even greater role in, um, well, uh, food uh, change, um, biomass production, and nutrient cycling, for example. Um, so one of the opportunities or one of the, the good things might be that um, we catch a lot of hidden biodiversity by such a sampling method. Um, so this is roughly how it's done. Uh, we take an environmental sample. This could be soil, this could be sediment, this could be uh, water, it could be even air. Uh, we extract the DNA from it, uh, and then we copy uh, specific parts of this DNA, like a million times. Uh, and then we sequence it, which means that we've got a genetic code, uh, the DNA made up barcodes. Um, now, with help of a reference database, we can try to um, find out which, um, to which species this belongs. Um, but you can imagine, and as I showed you in the last picture, a lot of biodiversity is still unknown. Uh, and even if a species is described, we, don't, we might not have its genetic information. Uh, so instead of going down all the way to species level, we can group them in very closely related individuals. Um, and this is based on the similarity of, of the ge uh, genetic code, which is um, most often like 97%. Um, so if they are more closely or more similar than 97%, they're grouped together in one unit. Uh, which is then an operational taxonomic unit. Uh, and this is the most common way to express microbial uh, diversity, actually. So I told you a little bit about the, uh, the case study already. This is our study area, uh, southern Sweden. Um, and we sampled in two, two different locations, which are very close, but very, very different in, in a way. Uh, on the right side, um, a region we call Dvalla. It's a very, a very diverse area characterized by very small, uh, small land use uh, patches. Um, very, uh, a lot of semi-natural pastures. Uh, on the left side, um, Skora, uh, the plains, uh, very um, much more production area, uh, large scale agriculture. Uh, and then we just sampled in agricultural fields forestry patches and uh, pasture patches. Um, and we did that by taking soil samples as well as insect samples. Um, and the reason for that is that insect samples are, um, well, they are not only more, well, 50 to 80% of all the total diversity we have, um, but also because they play a, a, an important role in ecosystem function. Um, but by looking at these insect samples, we won't only catch the diversity of these insects, but also uh, the, the organisms around it, like the pollen inside or uh, on the bodies of the insects, everything what's in their digestive uh, system, for example. Um, so that would give you a sort of a good overview of the surroundings of these insects as well. Now this is really like uh, ongoing work, a work in progress. We are right in the middle of uh, the data analysis, but I, I just wanted to show you some results. Um, 
And this is like the number of operational taxonomic units by uh, location and habitat. Uh, and just to have an idea about the, the number we're looking at, it's for uh, prokaryotic richness, so that's like bacteria, for example, we find around 1,000 to 3,000 operational taxonomic units per sample. And for eukaryotes, which are um, the animals, the plants, um, the fungi, uh, we find around 400 to uh, 1,200 uh, operational taxonomic units per plot, uh, per, uh, per sample. Um, we don't really see a um, significant difference between uh, the habitats or locations, but this is only richness. Um, so what we will do is we also will look at the, which taxonomic groups are actually in here. Um, and then we also um, will look at the correlations between the soil characteristics, uh, like uh, potassium, uh, phosphorus, um, some other soil characteristics, uh, and the texture of the soil, like how much clay, how much silt is in there, uh, to see if, that's, uh, uh, if, there's a, if there's a correlation there or not. Um, here we see a network analysis of the, of the different samples, uh, and it shows us how similar the different samples are. Um, and what we see here is that the communities we find within the different sampling methods are very different from each other. Uh, the operational taxonomic units in the insect samples uh, differ significantly from the communities in the soil samples. So it really matters how we sample. Um, yeah. Well, thanks a lot. Uh, I think it's... Um, we're excited actually to see what, what comes out of this uh, project. Um, but I think it has some, uh, has some potential we want to explore. And, uh, uh. Yes, um, that's a good question because we, I mean, if you, if you take a sample, obviously there is genetic material from uh, outside and we, we did take like samples from agricultural fields, but the, the chances that the DNA which is found there is coming from the surrounding areas. Um, we don't know exactly how far this DNA can travel, as you can say, but um, one a good thing to take into account is that um, you, you also mentioned the time perspective. Um, DNA degrades, um, but um, I think if a bird uh, passes, you can find the DNA still two weeks after that. Um, in the tropics, for example, the, the DNA will degrade much faster. Um, so there's an imbalance there. Um, and there are more imbalances, um, like whether you sample in the tropics or in Sweden. In the tropics, you don't really have seasons, which we have in Sweden. So if you, if you look at the insect samples, for example, it matters in which season you sample as well. Um, so these are all kind of things which needs to be standardized um, in a good way. Um, and we're not there yet. Um, but it, yeah, it, it should be uh, should be there at least.
Yes. The, um, there has, uh, we use like several focal species uh, which, um, which all have different demands in, in the connectivity or different demands in, in habitat uh, preferences, etc. Um, how this is mathematically like put into one uh, number as you... Um, uh, I'm not sure if I can explain that very shortly to you now. Um, this is, uh, it will be pub published hopefully soon. Um, and I think uh, then I, I will be better to, better be able to answer your question on how to, to do this mathematically. Um, mm? I have to press this. Um, thanks. I think we move on to the next um, slot of talks. Um, we have now um, actually four flash talks coming up that should be kind of three minutes each with one, uh, let's say, one quick question afterwards. And um, the first one will be given by Annalisa um, on sustainable intensification in Europe. And um, because we didn't plan it, well, I think uh, maybe we uh, put in Sandrine in the second talk of the short talk because we have one more talk. This it's okay for the others or any any spot. Do you know which one is here? This one, thanks. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for this three minutes uh, opportunity to present uh, the in interesting findings of our recently published paper on sustainable intensification in the European Union. As we all know, the in intensive food production in Europe ha have resulted in increased uh, anthropogenic greenhouse gas emissions. EU's uh, food consumption is also contributing to um, land use change and also greenhouse gas emission in exporting countries. So how could we meet the growing food demands without putting additional pressures to our environment? So sustainable intensification is uh, frequently mentioned as a potential solution to increase crop production while minimizing uh, environmental impacts. But uh, the conceptual framework of sustainable intensification does not only focus on, on agronomic developments. It's, it should also include other practices along the food value chain. So in this study, we selected uh, four different uh, sustainable intensification measures covering both the production and consumption. For production side, uh, we have included replacing soybean meal in conventional feed by food-based feed, replacing a continuous monoculture of cereal yards to uh, crop rotation with uh, grain legumes, and also incorporation of uh, crop residues into the soil. For consumption side, uh, shifting from current diet to national recommended diet. So in this study, we applied a life cycle assessment and scenario approach to quantify the greenhouse gas emission savings and land use savings of each of these uh, uh, sustainable intensification measures. So based on our findings, the average greenhouse emission savings in the production side measures is only 37 million tons CO2 equivalent per year compared to the emission savings in the consumption side, which is up to 283 million tons CO2 equivalent per year. But this one is also include 50, 
50% of the embodied greenhouse emission savings in trade due to the reduction of imports, mainly from South America. So uh, shifting to recommended diet could potentially uh, reduce EU's total anthropogenic greenhouse gas emission by 6%, while combining all the production side measures could only contribute 1% reduction. So more additionally, um, changing European diet to recommended diet could potentially reduce uh, land required for uh, crop production by 53 million tons hectare per year, which is equivalent to 44% of the permanent uh, croplands and arable lands of the European Union. So while in the production side, the land use savings is only 14% of the land use savings of the changing diet. But despite of the small contribution of the ag agronomic uh, practices in the production side, uh, in reducing emission, also in reducing impacts on land use, this could potentially reduce soil erosion and also uh, improve the soil organic carbon so in this, this study implies that a small changes in the European diet could uh, potentially or can make a big difference in uh, reducing local and overseas carbon and land use footprint. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Annalisa. We can take one or two quick questions. Sorry? Well, you, so you're saying changing consumption practices to reduce more yeah. gases than... Yeah, that's production, true. But it, isn't it the production of the food? Yeah, well, but, but no, sorry. Production side measures are uh, this, as I mentioned earlier, these are different sustainable intensification measures. So we compare uh, mo monoculture uh, wheat to uh, crop rotation with legumes. So we, we estimate how much greenhouse emission savings from these two different, uh, the current uh, reference scenario to the to sustainable test. Yeah. Which one? If we just combine it, we just mm, combine the, the 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 emission savings of both. Then this, yeah, we 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 just calculate it in in separate uh, separate scenarios. But we didn't really uh, calculate the the link of each. Yeah, so, but maybe in the future. I'm sorry. But there will be time afterwards to get up on this. Um, if it's okay for the one tower, the sweeping can ring now. I finished that ring yesterday. Yes. <laughs> and give a presentation on the Mexican livestock system. Actually, we're standing in for a person that was not able to come. And then I also was not able to come. Now, yeah. <laughs> So, uh, Maria, uh, fine. Yeah, so I'm standing in for Maria. Uh, we did the research on land required for meat in Mexico. Well, she did the job and I sometimes Skyped with her and gave her some advices. But, and then I'm the honor to present it here. Um, why Mexico? Well, Maria is living there and she has access to data, but if you look from broader perspective, 
uh, meat consumption in Mexico has doubled over the last 40 years and the production even went up with factor six and it had to do that more people were eating more and they also started to export. So the question is, well, if we produce this, how much land do we need for all things? So what we did is actually our method is starting from the consumption side. So we have meat and we start to calculate in kilograms. So we start with this, that's what's on your plate or in your kitchen. And if you, if you want to have this, then you need this to make it. And you need this person to cut it in pieces and to throw away half of it because we only like the nice chairs. And these cows have to live somewhere so we can calculate how much area is needed for them to be in this stage and then a share of the cows are also eating extra concentrates or whatever and these concentrates are actually made from often wheat but sometimes sorghum maize or whatever and then you if you know this then you can quantify all the steps so you know how much is lost at the butcher and what's the share of the the concentrates in the feed etc and then you can do a lot of calculations and we not only did it for the cows but we also did it for the pigs or maria did it for the milk and for the chicken and so we have and it's all based on the mexican situation we all did it earlier for the dutch thing but now she's doing it for the Mexican situation. And these were the outcomes. So in general, if we go for pigs and chicken meat, then uh, we need about 10 square meters of cropland. So that's the amount of area that you need to produce their feed. If you go for milk, it's also 10, but then half of it, it's the pasture land. But if we go for meat, for, for beef, then we go for 400. So that's far over everything, so it doesn't fit in scales, etc. This is because it's a very extensive um, system where they produce the beef in. If we, we did calculations for the Netherlands too, and then we end up at 80 square meters. So this is a typical Mexican situation. So the beef production is, uses fast amounts, and there's no way that with this system we can consume the future amounts of beef. So the Mexicans or have to change the system or have to go for chicken and the beef. pork. Thanks very much. Was, was this three minutes? Perfectly on time. <laughs> yes, on time. <laughs> and we have again time for one or two questions. Yeah, so if, if so, there's there's very little cropland used. So it's only in the in the finishing stage where they get fattened. There, there's concentrates coming in. So about one and a half year they are outside in this extensive pasture situation, and that's why you have this large amount of land needed. So it's it's the actual system. So if they want to produce more in future. Well, if, if it's 400 square meters per kilogram of beef, then you can cal calculate how fast you are actually out of your, eating out of your system boundaries. Yeah, but in principle, you can do something on the, on the grasslands because you can fertilize them. Right. And if you fertilize grasslands, then well, you heavily impact, have a heavy impact on, on, on the, uh, the ecosystem. But the pr production of the grasslands rises. It goes up with a factor 10. But then you have to start fertilizing these. And, and then you don't have the problem that, it's, that you can't convert them in grasslands or in croplands. Because, mm. yeah, but... 
it's disastrous if you start to do it. But the other, on the end, it's disastrous to put more cows in these systems because then you are over the uh, carrying capacity of these, this pasture. So getting too many cows in will destroy them. Very quick question. Yeah, um, quick answer. Quick question. Thank you for this interesting presentation. But when you're comparing, uh, well, different items, um, I heard that Earth of this uh, East Africa report that came out recently, that basically uh, told us that there is no uh, technological innovation, uh, no type of intensification that we can do uh, to meet uh, um, planetary boundaries. Mm -hmm. from, uh, um, yeah, going out, yeah. Uh, Animal-based uh, diet. <laughs> and, uh, so I'm wondering, from your field of expertise, how do you evaluate, how do you judge this type of, um, do you have any comments on to this type of, type of uh, um, study that basically consider the system itself with uh, boundaries that we only have one earth? Yeah, but, if, but then you, and then I can, tell you something, on, but it has nothing to do with this, this prison. If you really want to go for sustainable meat, then you should eat the amount of meat that's produced on your waste streams. Because if you eat sugar and vegetable oil and, and that type of, of luxurious things in our diets, there's a waste stream behind. This is, and so sugar, there's sugar beets, and there's sugar pulp, and there's sugar. We eat the sugar, there's sugar pulp remaining, and that's great stuff to feed to cows. If you consume only meat that actually run on the base, waste streams from other, our other consumption, then you have actually uh, environmental friendly meat consumption. But that's, that's a system story that's not in here. Okay, I think we have two more at the time. I think there will be also a chance to discuss more about that over the coffee break. Um, I, Dora, next in the program. Friedman and Kissinger. Well, okay, uh, can you hear me? Great, okay, the opening slide. I come from Israel, um, which is very famous these days, um, I think, for this, and um, for the mic dropping, the, actually, um, for hosting the Eurovision contest. But I would like to tell you two more things about Israel. Still work? It's okay. Yeah? I'd like to tell you two more things about Israel that you may not know. So first, we love food, we love, we love eating. And the second one is that we import most of our diet. In fact, many countries these days depend on food imports and um, increasingly drive environmental pressures in remote, um, remote sending regions. Um, but environmental impact is um, a function of both environmental pressure and special context. And um, many, st and, and, and Studies that um, analyze the flows of different um, crops uh, and resources from specific location opposed to the national level are still quite scarce. Um, so we um, asked about Israel, what, um, what would be the environmental effects or the distant environmental effects of the flows of different food crops into Israel? Uh, and specifically, we um, studied uh, soil loss, potential soil loss, and the water availability. Um, so in order to investigate it, we decided to cross the, um, into the global production system, crop production system, into unique classes um, based on their environmental state, 
and their um, agricultural performance. Um, we call these kind of combination functional regions. Uh, we use the crop specific and special explicit data on yields, irrigation, um, potential soil loss, and water availability, and we cross them together to get 24 unique classes of functioning. Finally, we used um, trade data to um, quantify the flows of crops into Israel from each functional region. So this analysis allow us um, first to get kind of a initial assessment of the environmental pressures and potential environmental impacts of Israel food consumption. And second, we can identify specific regions with higher or different environmental impacts. And then we can also um, identify preferred production regions for specific crops and explore different measures of um, improving on the current cropland to crop allocation. The future of functional regions um, requires more, um, more indicators, more environmental indicators, more agricultural indicators. It should be applied globally, not only to Israel and um, include um, additional um, temporal or uh, time periods. But we believe that functional regions and similar typologies are um, essential step in the way for a more holistic assessment of uh, the impact food has on the environment and speci specifically on remote environments in global reality. And thank you. Hope it still works. Yeah. Yeah. We broke it. Yeah. You can shout. So, I have a question to the audience. It can also be about the Eurovision. <laughs> 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 Are the products imported into Israel considerably different from the ones that are produced in Israel that you're doing for Chanel? Yeah. Uh, so basically, um, I, I didn't mention, but this analysis covered uh, four, crop, four pro products, which are um, wheat, uh, rice, um, soybeans, and maize. Um, we chose these products um, for specifically because they are barely um, or not at all produced in Israel. Soybeans and rice are not produced in Israel. Maize is produced to some extent and wheat to some extent, but both are heavily imported um, specifically for um, as feeds for intensive uh, uh, livestock um, systems. Um, so it's not the same. Uh, for wheat, um, the yields in Israel are inferior related um, if you compare them to other um, importing uh, regions. Oh, it's in Hebrew. Oh, the Hebrew. So, the slide. Basically, these are the, these are the data sets we used. Um, on the left is the agricultural system. Yield would come from the special production allocation model for the year 2005, now available also for 2010. Water intensity is from water stat, you can an, an orchestra data set. Uh, there are more, I think you know. Yeah. And um, then on the other side, the potential soil loss is the uh, USLE, um, universal soil loss equation from Gladys. Data set. It's Faust. It's a FAO um, and UN um, project, and the aridity index. I think is from season. I'm not sure. Uh, can, can check it. I don't remember. So basically, these are the different uh, data sets, and we cross the variable categories. So we just cut them very simplistically by the mean, low, and high. But we will apl uh, apply more sophisticated um, clustering in the future. Okay, thank you very much, Joa. Thank you. Take it off. Yeah, six months old project. Um, uh, 
That working? Yeah. Okay. So, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for coming. Thanks to uh, the organizer for uh, the invitation, and it's a great pleasure to be part of this session. Um, so, my name is Carol Dalin, and I'm presenting some work that is um, part of a new project, as uh, Thomas just mentioned, called Biota. And if you're interested in following it, you can um, follow it on the on the website. So this is um, uh, the study that I, I'm presenting, is preliminary study, uh, which was led by Charlie and with Monica and team. So it's a project at, at UCL looking at the interactions uh, worldwide between agricultural land use and biodiversity change. Um, so we know that agriculture is the major, um, land, the most threatening land use uh, type to biodiversity. And uh, we want to basically, the, the overall aim of the project is to try and improve biodiversity uh, models uh, in terms of specifically the impact of agriculture, um, le agricultural land use. And uh, eventually to also link that to trade, to trace the, the impact of consumption on biodiversity in remote regions. Um, so before, and you can see from the from the graph, uh, the, the different land use type in terms of agriculture, they were plantation, cropland, and pasture. So it's relatively coarse in distinction in a way. And also the intensity metrics were just kind of a three level, four level uh, metrics of intensity. So in, here we are trying to look at more specific drivers, um, looking at agricultural land use characteristics and also landscape uh, factors and how this affects biodiversity differently. So we use global data sets uh, that uh, you can see here. The PREDIX one is used for the response, the biodiversity response. And then we are considering other global data sets for intensity of agricultural land use, uh, including number of crops, production, fertilizer, and so on. Uh, in the landscape where we have biodiversity data and the heterogeneity uh, and diversity of the landscape so homogeneity, distance to forest, etc. Um, so these are preliminary results, uh, looking at two of those drivers, uh, distance to forest on the left. So you can see the relationship uh, we find so from mixed effects model, uh, the species richness decreases as we uh, go further away from forest, which is what we would expect. And we find this is quite significant in all the, the three type of uh, landscape that we have looked at. So you see the three colors indicate the different landscape. For the total fertilizer application, the e effect is not as clear. Um, you can see some effects in secondary vegetation um, uh, landscape type. So we are still working on uh, assessing these results and also looking at the influence of uh, other drivers. And as I said, in the future we will um, uh, look at different species group, and we have all kinds of great plans with trade. So if you want to follow uh, what happens, if you want to get in touch or have any questions, um, please contact us via the website, and thanks for your attention. So uh, it's what, whatever will be oops, in the, in the da PREDIX database. So it's a lot of diff different species groups. And I don't know the details, to be honest. But uh, we, want to, we, we want to look in the future more specifically at uh, predators of pests, uh, at pollinators. So at least I know those are in there. But yeah. We would l yes, of course, yes, exactly. So we would love to have pesticide. Uh, the thing is, we are doing that globally, uh, also with the view of looking at food trade uh, in the next phase. 
So we would need a specially explicit database on pesticide input, which to our knowledge doesn't exist. If anyone in the room knows one, please come and tell me. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so we, we might do, I know US, US as well, but yeah, we don't know about the global one, so that's why it's not, but we could do a different scale uh, kind of pilot. Okay, yeah. So the forest type we use is from the, this data set, which is, um, uh, and we use the type called dense forest. Mm -hmm. So it's a proxy for primary vegetation, so we want to exclude those kind of managed, so I don't, I hope uh, it shouldn't be there. <laughs> yeah, that's the, that's the idea, yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah, so um, I'm going to present you uh, um, our work on a hybrid multi-regional input-output model. Uh, and um, as a case study, I, I decided to uh, show some results on the Brazilian cattle supply chains. Um, yeah, so um, I hope you all have a basic idea of what uh, an input-output table is. Or um, Here's uh, an example of a multi-regional input-output table where you would have um, the product by product, um, um, the, the flows, the inputs of, of products into the production of other products and, and also the linkages between countries, so the international trade flows would be uh, depicted there. Um, and um, yeah, a hybrid MRAO model, um, as I use this term, does mean that it's a mixed unit. Uh, uh, I.O. table, so that combines physical and monetary units. So um, agricultural and food products are captured in physical units and non-food products in monetary units. So uh, first, uh, the physical part. Um, this is um, the, the recently, um, or the soon published um, uh, food and agriculture biomass input output uh, model Fabio, which covers 127 agricultural commodities and three silvicultural commodities. Uh, you see here uh, it contains like um, 60 64 primary crops and uh, 32 processed products, mainly vegetable oils and cakes and sugars and beverages. Then uh, live animal uh, categories 14 and, and 17 livestock products. Um, then uh, it covers trade between 192 countries and a time series currently of uh, 28 years, starting in 1986. Uh, the data sources, so I think 95% uh, or more, um, is actually from FAO stat, mainly the commodity balances and the bilateral trade data, but also other uh, data domains from FAO stat were used. Um, biofuels production was sourced from International Energy Agency and uh, the Energy Information Administration, and biofuels trade from UN Comtrade and Baki. Feed use, uh, very important for this uh, work, feed use um, was, um, or feed balances were constructed based on um, a publication by Bauman et al. Um, um, that's the approach used in the uh, image model. 
So I can't go into more details now in this talk, but so just quickly, this is the, the result. Uh, that's a, a heat map of uh, countries, 192 uh, countries by 192 countries, and just showing that the trade flows that are captured, you see that the domestic flows are very dominant, of course. Um, if we zoom into one of these um, pixels, we would see something like this, the domestic flows. Um, um, so the product inputs to produce each product, so that's on the main diagonal, that's basically the seed use um, um, to produce the same crop. And then here we have the processing use. Um, there are also some, some commodities that stuck out, like uh, here that's the feed use in animal husbandry. Um, and here is actually where the, the live animals are then uh, converted into animal products. Uh, here is um, the oil crops that are processed into oils and cakes. Uh, here, this bar is alcoholic beverages and ethanol. So, and this is all in physical units, so in, in tons and for the live animals in thousand heads. Um, then um, in the next step, I link this physical uh, MRO uh, with X, XUBase, a monetary MRO. Um, so, I, um, but only for the so-called other uses in, uh, in the commodity balance sheets of FAO, other uses are defined as industrial non-food uses plus uh, pet food. Um, so, for example, the, the, the vegetable oils um, or the, the, thanks, the palm oil um, used for, for uh, industrial processes, non-food purposes, uh, is then allocated according to the uh, use shares of vegetable oils in manufacturing sectors in XU base. Uh, thereby, I can f uh, trace also these non-food supply chains until the final consumption. So this whole uh, matrix has then a dimension of 35,000 rows and columns. It's quite difficult to invert that on a, a, a laptop, uh, probably impossible. So, and then we go already into the results. Um, there should be also, yes, okay. So, uh, what I have not mentioned is that uh, there is a, f a version of Fabio that is using mass-based allocation and a version of Fabio that is using price-based allocation. So you can switch between allocations, you can even uh, apply energy allocation or whatsoever. Um, and uh, yeah, we will see that that, that makes a difference on, on the results. Um, so in the case of the Brazilian cattle sector, it uses a 10 million hectare of uh, grassland and 4.5 million hectare of cropland to feed 200 million um, uh, uh, cows uh, and to produce roughly 10 million tons of meat per year. So uh, if you just attribute that to meat, then um, it, it converts into um, kilogram, uh, no, into square meter per, per kilogram of meat. So it's 100 square meter of grassland per kilogram of meat, uh, roughly, and 4.5 square meter of cropland per kilogram of meat. Uh, uh, you might know that in Brazil, 90% of the cattle is fed uh, solely on, on um, pasture and not using any crops. Uh, then we see in this mass-based allocation, uh, we see 12% non-food uses. So uh, the cattle supply chain is actually not very um, complicated. Most of it ends in Brazil. Um, only, there, there are only little exports of, of life animals, uh, which I, I can imagine for Venezuela, but I don't know how um, 
millions of cattle are exported to, to Lebanon. That's one of the biggest export flows. Um, yeah, but it's actually happening. So, and then you see here, um, the gray bars are the non-food uses, which is mainly leather, as you can assume. Um, and the food uses is mainly meat. Um, that's this big bar here. It's the meat that is produced in Brazil, other food that is animal fats, uh, for example, and, and leather and other non-food products. Um, yeah, as I said, most of it uh, is also consumed in Brazil. Also, most of the leather, 84% of the leather, is actually consumed in Brazil. Um, and yeah, exports are only 19%. Uh, uh, then if we switch to the price-based allocation, we will see that the non-food share reduces to only 6%. So it's, it's only half uh, of the result with the um, yeah, mass-based allocation. And that's, that's because the, the non-food products have a, a smaller value. So they receive less of the inputs with price allocation. Um, and then also we see here that this number is smaller, the cropland that is used to feed them because the, the uh, soybean cake has also a smaller value than the oil. Um, okay, but then the structure of course does not change, just the non-food part is reduced. Uh, then here we see just for the non-food products that uh, leather uh, is of course the biggest, followed by biofuels, uh, all kinds of manufacturing products, uh, other chemical products, and so on. I have to speed up. I, yeah, time is up. I, I added results on Indonesian palm oil here. I have to skip that, um, but I found it interesting because here the non-food part, of course, is much larger. Um, it's 64%. Um, yeah, and also you can see here the, the product uh, mix uh, then is much, there's much more uh, ver variety of products that is produced with that. So to um, wrap up, um, I hope I could show that uh, hybrid MRO is a useful tool to trace uh, international agri-food supply chains. Um, um, it, uh, it allows us to use the full uh, product and country detail of FAO stud uh, and the full coverage of non-food non products um, from Exio base and the supply use table uh, and input output table framework uh, is a very transparent or, uh, form of organizing product flow data. Yeah, with that, I finish. Thank you. Yeah, exactly. So currently uh, I only have land. Um, that's the starting point and um, uh, I'm collabor collaborating with a team from uh, Spain to, to build a um, carbon emission uh, extension and energy use and um, um, also uh, fertilizer extensions. Yeah, but that's really starting now and will also include other, hopefully, but that's all, all based also on collaboration, so if anyone wants to collaborate on that, I'm really happy to receive your emails. <laughs> and also you are free to, to use that. Um, the, the codes are all available on GitHub. Um, the database will be available on Zenodo once the paper is published. Uh, the link is already given here, but not yet uh, active. Thank you.
<coughs> okay. Uh, hello, everybody. I am Lucia Sarva. Thanks for uh, being here. It's uh, late, so it's the last presentation. I'm sure you're tired, but it's it. And um, so during the 21st century, Latin America has experienced both cropland reduction and cropland expansion. As you can see in the map, cropland reduction is mainly associated with um, forest transition, increase of urbanization, and abandonment of uh, less profitable land. Whereas cropland expansion is mainly associated with commodity agribusiness. Uh, well, looking at forest cover loss, Curtis and collaborators in 2018 found that um, commodity agribusiness was responsible for up to 64% of uh, total deforestation in Latin America during that period of time, which is the red color in the map. Um, one particular thing of agri uh, commodity agribusiness is that it's less dependent on local factors than other types of, of agriculture, which makes it more unpredictable. Uh, it seeks for uh, lands with higher rent, which could be far uh, because of they are cheaper lands, but not that far because they need supplies uh, and um, need to be near the city for supplies and logistics. So being such an important driver of land use change is important to understand its dynamics, uh, but it is very complex. So in this study, we attempt to identify potential areas for commodity agribusiness, future expansion. And we focus on ecoregions because ecoregions are a unit frequently used in conservation policy. So our questions are, which ecoregions are more alike in attributes relevant for commodity agribusiness? What combination of attributes were associated with 21st century cropland dynamics pattern, and which ecoregions are potentially vulnerable to expansion of agribusiness and which to cropland abandonment. So how we do this? First, we characterize the ecoregions based on four uh, attributes relevant for commodity agribusiness, which are uh, the aptitude for mechanized agriculture, the aptitude for rain-fed agriculture, uh, the distance to local consumption and logistic centers, which could also be understood as historic factors or distance to cities, the distance to distribution and export centers or globalization factors, which is actually distance to ports. With that data, we perform uh, cluster analysis. Actually, we perform several cluster analysis, playing with different thresholds of those variables to identify similarities, uh, which ecoregions are more similar to each other. And then we uh, compare the outputs of those cluster analysis through a correlation with actual uh, cropland pattern. And finally, we describe those clusters. So first we start with data uh, that we categorize and labeling land into different aptitude levels. Optimum in blue, orange, uh, pardon, uh, sorry, intermediate in orange, fair in pink, and bad in black. And then we compute for each ecoregion the percentage of these different attribute levels for each of the four uh, attributes, which I'm not going to show now because of a matter of time, but we repeat this for each of them. So with that data, uh, we um, perform the cluster analysis. And we, as I said before, we did it several times playing with these alternative aptitude levels. And we did it 162 times. Uh, which I'm not going to show them all. I'm just going to tell you that we compare them through a correlation with uh, actual uh, cropland in 2001, cropland gain, and cropland loss. And we choose the best fit model, which is the one in red, uh, based on the, the explanation power and information criteria. And this best fit model found eight clusters and used um, the optimum land for mechanized and rain fed and distant to cities, and fair land uh, in distant to ports. This is the actual map, the eight clusters and the colors. <coughs> and in the right, you can see, yeah, it's your right also, you can see uh, the decision tree. So if you put any ecoregion on the top of this decision tree and you follow these uh, rules, you will uh, identify to which cluster this ecoregion belongs. And then we rank those clusters with our star method. Uh, we gave them one star per attribute, and this star will be a full star if 
the optimum land for that attribute was more than 70%. It's a half star or an empty star. Uh, if the mean inter intermediate land was more than 70%, and a ghost or gray uh, star, it didn't meet that criteria. So we have here in cluster one, all four stars. That cluster is named highly connected humid lowlands. And, and it's the winner, uh, it's the one that uh, every business would prefer. Then we have cluster five, far humid lowlands with two and a half stars. Accessible semi-arid lowlands, cluster number two. Far but linked humid lowlands, cluster number eight. Then uh, remote humid lowlands, cluster number seven. Accessible semi-arid hills, in cluster number three. Accessible humid hills in cluster number four and far mountain drylands in cluster number six. Uh, well, how, did, how much actual cropland do we have in each of them? So these first four, sorry, why, where is the, I guess it's this one, yeah. So these first four clusters, um, they have actually a lot of uh, cropland area and a lot of cropland area change whereas these other four have way less cropland area. Thank you. And um, one characteristic of these first four attributes is that they are close to cities, whereas these other four clusters are uh, far from cities or are remote. So we consider, I mean, it's not a surprise that being close to cities uh, is a good aptitude for agriculture, but it's a good thing that it came up in the model. So these are the clusters that we identified had the best aptitude for uh, um, agribusiness, commodity agribusiness. Uh, so here in, in the pink one, we can have uh, places like La Pampa, uh, sorry, the Pampa region in South America, uh, as well as part of the uh, Cerrado region. And then accessible semi-arid lowlands, we have the Chaco region and Chiquitania and um, far humid lowlands, which doesn't have currently that much uh, cropland, but it has the potential for having it. And then we have another uh, cluster, which is uh, accessible semi-arid hills in orange, which uh, it does have currently in a considerable cropland area, but it is, it is in decrease as you can see in the green, in the green uh, box there. So it's a case of cropland abandonment clusters. And uh, finally, we have our least preferred cluster for agribusiness, which include um, far mountains and drylands, uh, which are also in decline in, in cluster, um, uh, sorry, in uh, cropland area, and remote humid lowlands in orange over there in Brazil. So the main conclusions of this work. Uh, first of all, a simple model like this explain about half of the cropland distribution. Uh, the other half would, might be through no considered factors such as uh, price of land, policy regulations, or law enforcement. Uh, the model that best correlated with cropland patterns was exigent in aptitude for mechanized agriculture, rain-fed agriculture, and distant to cities, but flexible in distance to ports. Distant to cities plays an important role in defining the cropland pattern. And uh, whereas evidence of influence of distant to port, ports is still weak. And we propose this grouping as a guiding stratification of the ecoregions of South America to analyze land use process, processes, especially the cases related with agribusiness expansion and its cascade effects. Thank you. <laughs>
Yeah, uh, well, sorry, it's not the 50% of the land, it's the 50% of the explanation. Uh, but uh, I don't know how much land would that be. But uh, yeah, uh, the factors that we didn't consider in this study are um, uh, mostly political, uh, such as uh, uh, laws and regulation, I mean enforcement of the law, and um, prices of land and labor. Uh, we didn't consider that in this analysis. Yeah, well, so first of all, I do not recommend agribusiness go to there. I'm just saying that it's, uh, it, it, it could have the potential, so it's, it will not be strange if it happens there. And um, so, no, we didn't, uh, and also the boundaries of this, uh, since we took ecoregions as a unit, sometimes the boundaries, it's because the, it's the boundary of an ecoregion, which we consider the, the mean for, for the analysis, but it doesn't mean that it's for all of the area. But anyway, we didn't consider, uh, we didn't look at environmental uh, again, implications yet. Yeah, yeah. It, uh, this is half of, this is part of my PhD and uh, other um, uh, parts of my PhD we consider uh, uh, natural versus anthropic uh, land use changes. Thank you for your question. Thank you very much.